In this video, we dive deep into the enhanced knowledge graph concept I introduced in the last episode. How does it represent knowledge? Why is it so powerful? And most importantly, how does it actually learn? I'll answer all these questions and give you an exclusive look at the prototype software so you can see it in action and even try it out for yourself. Don't miss this chance to explore a game-changing approach to AI. To reach the next level, AI needs to interact intelligently with the real world. It must understand things at a fundamental level. Just knowing lots of facts will never be enough. AI needs to understand things like object persistence, three-dimensionality, the passage of time, and cause and effect. Things any child knows which are absent in today's AI. The graph-based approach intends to address these questions. While you can watch without the previous episode, you'll get a bigger picture and put this information in context if you watch this video first. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. In addition to AI work, I've developed software for several neurological test instruments and neural simulators and along the way, learned a lot about the capabilities and limitations of biological neurons and how your brain must work to do the things it does. The software I'll use in this video is the freely available community-developed Brain Simulator 3. The GitHub link is in the description. I also invite you to join the Future AI Society and participate with ideas or code. So what's unique about this approach? The primary storage in the Brain Simulator 3 is an enhanced knowledge graph called the Universal Knowledge Store, or UKS. Like all graphs, it's a connection of nodes connected by edges, which is how your brain must store similar information. I've made other videos on why this is how the brain must work. Within the UKS, nodes are called things, while edges are called relationships. My go-to first relationship is Fido is a dog. You could imagine that it looks like this, but it's not quite that simple. In the UKS, the relationship type is also a node. I'll explain this in another video. If we looked inside your brain, we'd see that neurons don't have these convenient labels. If we remove them, how does the graph represent knowledge? Bear with me for a moment in the following description. The end result will be really cool. Let's start with an incoming sound wave representing the words, Fido is a dog. If we have a phoneme detector, it can find the phonemes in the waveform and fire the appropriate things representing the phonemes heard. I've only shown a few, but English uses 44 phonemes. Now we can have things which represent words, which are activated when the right phonemes show up in the right order. If we imagine a phoneme generator as well, we could traverse the relationships in reverse so that activating the thing labeled Fido would speak the word Fido. The two things we've added, Fido and dog, represent words. They don't represent either Fido or a dog. And here's where we decouple language from meaning. Since most words have multiple meanings and most ideas can be expressed with multiple different words, we need to have separate things which represent the underlying meaning. I won't go into detail of how right now, but let's say that in this context, dog means this specific thing and Fido means that specific thing. Notice that all these things have unambiguous meanings. The thing representing the word dog unambiguously represents the word. It can have attributes of how it is pronounced or how it is spelled, and it may have any number of meanings. It's a word. The meaning we are following means a four-legged animal, which is commonly a pet. 
but we could add more things and relationships to solidify this meaning. Now we have specifically identified which Fido and dog things we are thinking about, we can add the is a relationship between the two. Now this graph can answer questions like, what is Fido? And name some dogs. But here's the key. You can remove all the labels from the nodes and the graph will still work the same way. You can ask the questions and get the answers in the form of spoken words, but there's no data in the graph nodes. So, what is a knowledge graph if you take out the knowledge? Without the labels, this looks a lot more like a spiking neural network than a knowledge graph. This is not a coincidence. The design came from my explorations with a spiking neural simulator. So let's compare this approach with a typical neural network and a typical knowledge graph. All three are forms of graphs, but the neural network has a predefined organization of layers and connections. Generally, graphs can connect any node to any other, something not allowed in an artificial neural network. In the ANN, the nodes have no meaning. Or perhaps every node has a meaning, but we can't know what it is. In the UKS, all things have specific meanings, but we can only find out what the meaning is by activating the node and observing the output. In a knowledge graph, the meaning is typically stored in the node itself, and it can be quite extensive. In the UKS, relationship weights represent the confidence that the relationship is true. In a neural network, the connections have weights, but we don't really know what they mean. And in a generic knowledge graph, weights may or may not be used. In the UKS, you can add new relationship types as needed, while most knowledge graphs use only predefined relationship types, while a neural network has only one, the connection. So a thing, which is a node, is an abstraction which could represent anything. A physical object, an action, an attribute, a sensation, a step in an algorithm. In your brain and in the brain simulator, things are unambiguous, abstract concepts. For simplicity of explanation, I put a label on each thing. Remember that these labels do not impact the meaning of the UKS. Well, let's look at this in action with the Brain Simulator 3. I've configured it with a set of low-level dialogues which allow me to directly manipulate the UKS content. The four I'll touch on today are the UKS content display, add statement, query, and add clause. I'll start with an initialized UKS which contains just the rudiments necessary to get the structure off the ground. In the add statement dialog, I'll add the fact that Fido is a dog. Note that I'm directly manipulating the internal meanings while ignoring the words they may represent. In the UKS display, things and relationships which are new or updated turn green for a few seconds to draw your attention. Fido is indented under dog to indicate that Fido is a dog. This is just a simple way of displaying is a relationships. Dog is indented under unknown object because that is the default location for all new things. Although the graph has no information about what a dog is, it is now confident that Fido is one. We can easily add to the hierarchy that dogs are animals and see how this is represented. The order in which information is received should have little impact on the resulting structure. Likewise, we can add attributes to Fido by saying that Fido is brown. This is shown a bit differently in the UKS display, as you can see. Is relationships are displayed as an indented tree structure, and other relationships are shown as a list. Within the UKS, 
is that relationships are just like any other relationships. They're just displayed as a tree for convenience. Is relationships are special in that things can inherit attributes from their ancestors, as I'll show you. If I use the query dialog to retrieve the attributes of Fido, I get that Fido is brown. If I add the fact that a dog has fur, Fido inherits that fact from its ancestors. I can see the source of the knowledge by selecting full relationships and repeating the query. From this, I can see that Fido is brown and Fido has fur because Fido is a dog. I can repeat the process by saying that dogs have four legs. I can see that Fido gets four legs through inheritance. Let's add a few more attributes. Dogs have tails and dogs have two eyes. You can see the power of attribute inheritance, as I've said in other videos. It's a dramatic form of data compression, which also reduces the computational requirement in your brain and in the brain simulator. We can consider that dog is a class representing all dogs, and that the is a relationship more specifically means is a member of the class. By simply adding Rover is a dog, the system can immediately report any number of attributes for Rover without knowing anything else. Your mind does this all the time. If you hear that Goldie is a grandmother, your mind can immediately picture Goldie. The image may be wrong in some respects because Goldie is not a typical grandmother, but your mind can figure that out soon enough and correct your image of Goldie as soon as you get information. The UKS supports exceptions, so I can say that Tripper is a dog. Poor Tripper only has three legs. When we query the attributes of Tripper, we can see that the three legs attribute overrides the has four legs attribute of the usual dog. I cannot overstate the importance of this capability, the capability of handling exceptions to usual inheritance rules. When related to how your mind stores information about people you know, you don't need to remember all of a person's attributes. You only need to remember the exceptions, the things that make a person unique. Your mind and the UKS fill in all the common attributes automatically. The last feature I'd like to introduce is the concept of clauses. Consider that Fido can play fetch. We can see that in the attributes, especially when we focus the query to only look for can play attributes. Now we'll add the conditional phrase that Fido can play frisbee if the weather is sunny. When we look at Fido's attributes, we can see that he can play both fetch and frisbee because the weather is sunny. If we tell the UKS that the weather is not sunny, then when we ask what Fido can play, he can only play fetch. Notice that on its own, the phrase Fido can play frisbee cannot be determined as either true or false. It depends on the state of the second clause. Even the clause, if the weather is sunny, is neither true nor false on its own. It depends on the actual state of the weather. Overall, the if statement creates contingent information where the veracity of one relationship is conditional on other relationships, that is, on the context of the situation. This clause structure connects one relationship to another, as opposed to a single relationship which connects one thing to another. Although just getting started, this concept has unlimited possibilities for real-world knowledge. For example, if Fido played Frisbee in the park yesterday, this can be represented by a few clauses like this. This implies that every factoid your mind knows is in the here and now, at a position visible in front of you and in the present. Then you can modify this information to any location and time frame with a few simple clauses. 
which could be searched in the same way as other things in relationships. To summarize, the UKS provides many features needed to represent information in the form of a graph. With its inheritance, exceptions, and clauses, it may already be capable of representing anything your mind can. Imagine if you can think it, the UKS can represent it. For more details on the UKS and how to use the Brain Simulator 3, watch this video. It covers topics like sequences, details of relationship types, confidence, and durations, properties, numbers, and exclusivity. If you're interested in how the UKS can learn, you could watch this video. In the meantime, I hope you'll join the Future AI Society and participate in our progress. Of course, likes, subscribes, and comments are always appreciated. I look forward to interacting with you directly through the Society, and of course, thanks for watching.